Hi, this is Chuck. Welcome to the review of trigonometry part two for Applied Calculus 1. All right, so in the first part of the review of trigonometry, we discussed sine and cosine and tangent. And I'd also made mention that in the business world, there really are some legitimate needs for the use of trig functions in modeling seasonally produced, seasonally sold items and the use of sine and cosine to model those. So what we're going to do here is we're going to continue taking a look at some of the background on trig, starting with a sine, a sine graph, which is what we have here at the top of the page. One of the things or terms that you need to be familiar with is talking about the period of the function. This talks about how long does it take before the function returns to its original position. So if you look at this graph, you can see here at the start, it starts at zero. It goes up, comes down. Now it's zero there, but it's on a downward trend. But over here, it's zero again, back on an upward trend. When you pass through a wave, so you get back to the position where you were the first time, that is a period. In physics for things like sound waves, it's called a wavelength. Okay, so what we're going to wind up wanting to do here is we're going to wind up wanting to focus on, first off, how long is one period? How long is one repeating cycle? Okay, you can measure it from like what I just drew here, or you can measure it from the peak to the next peak, or a trough to the next trough. Any of those three measurements will put you in the same place to determine what the period is. The amplitude talks about how tall the wave gets, how far the graph will deviate from the midline, the midline being what's right down the middle like that. So there's the midline. And then when you look up above it or down below it, that amount above or below is called the amplitude. Okay, so that's something else that we're gonna be paying attention to as we work through these problems. Another idea we need to make sure that is working well is the idea of coterminal angles. Coterminal means that they wind up in the same location. Okay, so for example, if we were looking at this graph at negative pi, this value is coterminal with this value, is coterminal with this value. Okay, you wind up with something like that being um, the same value, but the idea is not just being the same value, but being in the same location in the wave. Let's take a look at the unit circle. Okay, if we start out at zero here, we could go all the way around and we're right back to where we were. Now, by being right back to where we are means that the line that forms the angle there is in the same position. Or if you want, we could look at something like a 45 degree angle. It starts with this line here and the 45 degree angle is formed by that arc. An angle that would be coterminal with 45 would be this 45 degrees and then go all the way around to your back over there again. Now what's wound up happening is you've moved 45 degrees plus 360 degrees, which means you're really now at 405 degrees. But the point is at 45 degrees and 405 degrees lands you at this same location. Those are said to be coterminal. You can also talk about coterminal with regard to the radian measures. For example, at zero degrees or at zero, okay, radians, the angle is right there. If you go around two pi, the angle is going to be right there again. What this says is that zero and two pi are coterminal. Now, you could go around once, be coterminal, you could go around twice, 
B code terminal, go around three times, you get the idea. Okay, so what winds up being the case is, as you can see here to the left, there are an infinite number of coterminal angles that match up with a radius of measure of zero or two pi or four pi or whatever you want to be for sine. The same thing is true if we were to work with 180 degrees, or in other words, pi. If we start here and we go around another time, we still end up here. If we go around another time, another time being another 2 pi, we still end up there. And all of those angles, once again, are coterminal. So pi, 3 pi, 5 pi, 7 pi are all coterminal, meaning that they end or terminate at the same location on the unit circle. In both examples here, I kind of talked about sine, but this same idea works for cosine as well. There are several other trig functions that you're going to need to be familiar with. One of them is tangent, and tangent is just taking the value for sine divided by cosine. Cotangent is the reciprocal of tangents, that's just cosine over sine. Secant is the reciprocal of cosine, and cosecant is the reciprocal of sine. So you wind up with a total of six different trig functions, sine, cosine, tangent, cotangent, secant, cosecant. Let's take the graph of tangent and consider that for a minute. If you'll recall, tangent is sine divided by cosine. Now there are some locations where we're going to run into trouble. The locations are going to be any place where cosine is zero. Hmm. Well, let's go back up to our unit circle and ask where is cosine zero? Remember, cosine corresponds to the x value. Well, it's going to be zero up here at pi over two, zero down here at three pi over two. So what winds up happening is, at, for example, pi over 2, the function is undefined. Tangent is undefined. At 3 pi over 2, it's undefined. 5 pi over 2 is coterminal with pi over 2. And you'll see, once again, you wind up with an asymptote undefined. And you can do the same computations on the negative side of the x-axis as well. Tangent winds up repeating as a series of what looks like might be tall, thin s's. There are vertical asymptotes every pi units apart. So what winds up happening is this thing has a period of pi. It repeats and you get the same thing every pi units. The next thing to consider with this function is, what is the amplitude? In other words, how tall does it get? Well, with sine and cosine, there was a limit to the top of the wave. However, with tangent, um, this thing's going to head to infinity and to negative infinity. So as far as a maximum amplitude, it does not exist. The next thing we want to be sure we can do is to evaluate the trig functions given different angle measures. For example, you could be asked for the tangent of pi over 6. Well, first recall that tangent is sine over cosine. So this is going to give you the sine of pi over 6 over the cosine of pi over 6. Hmm, pi over 6, we can move back to our unit circle. And pi over 6 is right here. It's the 30 degree. The sine is going to be a 1 half. The cosine is going to be a square root of 3 over 2. So we'll take those values and we'll substitute them in. The sine, recall, was 1 half. The cosine was the square root of 3 over 2. When you have a fraction divided by a fraction, you can invert whichever fractions in the denominator and multiply the two. In this case, the twos will cancel and you get 1 over the square root of 3. You probably learned somewhere back in an algebra class that you don't leave square roots in the denominator. A big reason for that is, is that it's really hard to get a common denominator if you have several fractions to add together.
Okay, hard to do if you have a square root in the denominator. But if we take this fraction and multiply it by square root of 3 over square root of 3, which is really just a fancy way to say 1 because anything over itself is 1. So we're just multiplying by 1. So technically we're not changing the value of the fraction. But what wind up happening is when you multiply the numerators, you're going to get a square root of 3. When you multiply the denominators, you're going to get square root of 3 times square root of 3, which is square root of 9. Oh, that's 3. This tells us then that the tangent of pi over 6 is square root of 3 divided by 3. If we do something like comp computing the tangent of pi over 2, once again, we're going to break it up as sine divided by cosine. If you look up on the unit circle, the sine of pi over 2, which is the y value, is 1. The cosine of pi over 2, which is the x value, is 0. And you wind up with a fraction, 1 divided by 0, which is undefined. And it is completely legit to say that the value does not exist for this particular angle measure. With this information, we can kind of push the limits a bit, thinking about triangles. And we're going to bring into play now the Pythagorean theorem. Recall the Pythagorean theorem says a squared plus b squared equals c squared. If we draw a triangle, like you see here on the left side, we're going to have c is our hypotenuse, a is the adjacent side, and b is the opposite side. By calling these adjacent opposite and hypotenuse, it allows us to relate this back to the different trig functions. Notice in place of a squared, we can replace that with the adjacent side squared. b squared is the opposite side squared. c squared is the hypotenuse squared. And we can then take this equation that we now have which is a spin-off of the Pythagorean theorem. And if we divide all three terms by the hypotenuse squared, we'll wind up with the adjacent over the hypotenuse squared plus the opposite over the hypotenuse squared. And then on the right-hand side, we're going to have the hypotenuse over the hypotenuse, both of them squared, but anything over itself is really just one. So this gives us then when we rewrite adjacent over hypotenuse as cosine, opposite over hypotenuse as sine, it gives us that cosine squared plus sine squared equals 1. And realize that this is all just a restatement of the Pythagorean theorem. It's nothing new to you, just a different way to treat it. OK, so if we start with this newfound equation that I'll leave there at the top of the screen, we could take this entire equation and multiply it by 1 over cosine squared. Or in other words, divide by cosine squared. If we do that, that'll give us cosine squared over cosine squared, sine squared over cosine squared, and 1 over cosine squared. OK, well, what's that going to do for us? Well. Cosine squared over cosine squared gives us a value of 1. So we're going to have 1 plus. Sine over cosine is tangent, but here it's squared, so it's going to be tangent squared. So what this tells us is 1 plus tangent squared is equal to 1 over the cosine squared. Well, that's just secant squared. This gives us a new equation. Remember, we started out with the identity cosine squared plus sine squared is 1. From that, we derived a new identity. 1 plus tangent squared is secant squared. Now remember, you can rewrite this. You can subtract tangent squared from both sides, and you'll get 1 is equal to secant squared minus tangent squared. So you can rewrite these things to play it to your advantage when you're trying to simplify an equation. OK, so keep that in mind. You're not just stuck with the equation in its present form. Another identity that we can derive, once again turning to our equation up at the top, 
is to take that equation and divide each term by sine squared. Well, in the case of the first term, it'll give us cosine squared divided by sine squared. And the second term is going to be sine squared divided by sine squared. And the third term is going to be 1 divided by sine squared. When we rewrite these in terms of what the fractions are, cosine squared, well, cosine over sine is cotangent, so it's cosine squared over sine squared is going to be cotangent squared. Sine squared over sine squared, well, that's easy enough. Anything over itself is 1. And then when we have 1 over sine, that's secant, but in this case it's squared, so it's secant squared. As with the previous equation, we can subtract cotangent, and we'll get 1 is equal to cosecant squared minus cotangent squared. Once again, keep this in mind. It might be handy for simplifying things along the way. OK, so we have some of the trig identities. Suppose we're given some information, like the sine of an angle, and you're not told what the angle is. But you know that this value of sine is 1 over 4. And you're told that in this case it's in the first quadrant. That's important. It allows you to determine what the value of x is, whether it's positive or negative. We can use this information about sine to draw ourselves a right triangle. Remember with sine, the opposite side has a value of 1. And according to this, the hypotenuse has a value of 4. You can tell that by the fact that sine is um, opposite over hypotenuse. Okay. Using the Pythagorean theorem, we can take our a squared plus our b squared equals c squared. And when we simplify that, we're going to have a squared plus 1 equals 4 squared 16. So we subtract the 1, we get a squared is 15, or a, the value of our adjacent side, is square root 15. Now this is really nice because from this information now, we can derive a value for cosine, which is the adjacent square root of 15 over the hypotenuse, 4. We can also compute the value of tangent. Tangent is going to be the opposite over the adjacent. The opposite is this value of 1. The adjacent is this square root of 15. So we get 1 over square root of 15. But as we just discussed earlier, we really don't want to leave a square root in a denominator. So we rationalize it. And that'll give you square root of 15 over 15. A next thing to notice here is the graph of sine and cosine are the same shape, it's just that the one is slid over a little bit. So for example, if we're looking at cosine, and we were to grab this and move this in this direction, we would wind up with something that looks like that. That graph is exactly like the sine. Well, with that in mind, we can develop two new identities, the sine is the same thing as cosine moved over pi over 2 units. Or, if you want, the cosine is the sine adjusted pi over 2 units. So the basic idea here is you're just sliding cosine or sine back and forth on the x-axis to get it to line up with where you would have the other trig function. There are several additional identities that we're not going to take a whole lot of time um, developing, but you can find these in your book on page 622. And what these are, are these are identities that allow you to add two angles together and then compute the value. These are really handy as we need to compute angles that aren't on the unit circle. Remember, 30 degrees is pi over 6. And 45 degrees is pi over 4, but we didn't have anything for 15 degrees. However, we can use one of the trig functions here. In fact, this one. 
where to get to 15, we take the 45 degrees minus the 30 degrees. Okay, and the 45 minus the 30 is sure enough going to give us the 15, which is exactly what we're looking for here. So if we rewrite this cosine of 15 as cosine of 45 minus 30, we can then use this identity, which I just had an arrow coming down from, and it'll give us the cosine of 45 times the cosine of 30 plus. Watch these plus minus signs, okay? Be really careful. Um, they're mixed up, as in they don't always behave quite the same. It isn't the situation that if these are added, these are added. Notice for the sine, um, they match, but for the cosine, they're the opposite. And then if you come down with the subtraction, notice once again, the cosine is the opposite, but the sine is the same. So for example, if you have cosine minus, the identity is going to be plus. If you have the sine of t minus u, it's going to be the identity with a negative sign as well. So be careful of that. Okay, so what we've done here in solving this particular problem is we've got our cosine 45, cosine 30, plus sine 45, sine 30. Now the advantage to rewriting it like this is we know from the unit circle what the cosine of 45 is. That's square root 2 over 2. Additionally, from the unit circle, we know what the cosine of 30 degrees is. That's square root 3 over 2. From the unit circle, sine of 45 is square root 2 over 2. And sine of 30 is a value of 1 half. At this point, it's just down to some um, algebra. Multiply square root 2 times square root 3. We get a square root of 6 over 2 times 2 is 4. Remember, we're multiplying. We're not adding. Okay, so it's not just, oh, yeah, they have a common denominator and put a 2 down and move on. No, you multiply them. Okay, for the second fraction here, we've got square root of 2 times 1 gives us a square root of 2 over 2 times 2 gives us 4. So we have square root of 6 over 4 plus square root of 2 over 4 common denominator so we can combine them and what you wind up then getting is square root of 6 plus the square root of 2 all over that common denominator of 4. We can also use these trig identities 1 through 4 that um, there they are right there. We can use these to get what are called the double angle formulas. For example if we look at the cosine and if instead of it being t plus u, suppose it was t plus t, the same angle twice. Well, being the same angle twice, you would have t plus t, which is cosine of 2t, which is what we're looking at right here. t plus t gives us 2t. But the neat thing is we can use that identity from above and we're going to do the cosine of the first angle times the cosine of the second angle. They're both t in this case. Minus the sine of the first angle times the sine of the second angle. Once again, both t. And you get that the cosine of 2 times t is equal to cosine squared of t minus sine squared of t. So this is kind of handy to keep in mind as well. You can play the exact same game using sine of t plus t, except we're going to go up and we're going to look up the sine identity here where we have t plus u. And instead of t plus u, I'm just going to call this another t, okay, which we can then Remember, because it's plus on the left side for sine, it's going to be plus on the right side. Not true for cosine. Be careful. Okay, so what we're going to do here is we're going to have the sine of t, cosine of t, plus cosine of t, sine of t. Remember, those first values come from the first angle, 
the second values come from the second angle. But they're both t in this case. So this is going to give us sine of t cosine of t plus sine of t cosine of t, which gives us 2 sine of t cosine of t, which is another identity. It's called a double angle. Um, both of these are called double angle identities because you've doubled the value of the angle. Okay, so those are two more that you want to be familiar with. Okay, so where can we go from here? Well, suppose, let's see, let's leave this showing here. Let's see that you're given that the sine of t is 1 over 4. We're in the first quadrant, but you're asked to evaluate the sine of 2 times t. Now be really careful this isn't just 2 times the 1 fourth. You just don't go multiplying through by 2. But what you do is like we had done earlier, you develop your triangle. Remember 1 is the opposite side, 4 is the hypotenuse. Use the Pythagorean theorem to get this square root of 15 for the adjacent side. From that, you can then determine, well, the sine of our angle T is 1 over 4, opposite over hypotenuse. Cosine is the adjacent, square root of 15, over 4. We can then say that 2T, the sine of 2T, is going to be this particular identity here employed. It's going to be 2 times the sine of t cosine of t. But the cool thing is we know what sine of t is. It's 1 fourth. We know what cosine of t is. It's square root of 15 over 4. This then gives us 2 times a fourth times square root of 15 over 4. And at this point, it's all just algebra. We're going to have 2 times the square root of 15. Remember, 2 is the same thing as 2 over 1. You multiply the numerators, and you get 2 times the square root of 15 over, multiply the denominators, and you have 1 times 4 times 4, or a denominator of 16. You can factor out and cancel a 2, giving you a final value of square root of 15 over 8, being the double angle value. And notice, as I mentioned earlier, this does not just give you twice the sine of t. If it was twice the pi, or the 1 over 4, we would have gotten a value of 1 half. This is definitely not equal to 1 half.